So I think it's about half past. Uh, maybe it's time for us to begin the class. Uh, as you know, I'm Sister Chandasiri, and uh, uh, one of the first four nuns. I was ordained by Ajahn Sumedho in 1979 as a novice and then as a 10 precept nun in 1983. So I go back a long time. And I'm very happy to have the opportunity to spend the evening together with you all. And uh, we'll follow the format that I usually uh, follow when I lead the class, which will be to start off with a, a short puja. And Wanda will do the screen share. We'll chant in Pali this evening. And uh, first of all, I'll light the candles and incense. Um, that's all I need to say. Of course, you're welcome to chant along with me um, at home. Uh, and it's good if you stay muted for that. Um, otherwise, it turns out it can be a bit of a jumble. Um, so, in the gong. <laughs> Sabhagavato, Pupa Bhaganama, Karan Karoma, Sahay. 
I forgot to mention at the beginning that um, this is the Miln Tum Hermitage Shrine. Um, I think it's the first time that I've been here for one of these classes. So have a chance to see where I live and where I normally do my pujas. Um, you know, now's the time that we have for the refuges and precepts. And 
I'm wondering if Carol is there, if she would be willing to, to make the request again. Are you there, Carola? You did it beautifully last time. Um, but if Carola's not there, then someone else may be able to do it. If you are there, you'll need to unmute yourself. Sister Carola is not there today, I think. Carola's not She's, there, okay. Yeah. Maybe Nick, would you be willing to, to do it? to make the request on behalf of yes, the group. Yes, I'm happy to do that, sister. That, that'd be great, thank you. Maya maya tisara nena saha pancha silani achama duti ampi maya maya tisara nena saha pancha silani achama tati ampi maya maya Tisaranena saha pancha silani achama. So Nick has uh, made the formal request for the Tisaranena, the triple refuge, refuge in the Buddha, refuge in the Dhamma, refuge in the Sangha. The Buddha, our capacity for perfect knowing and understanding the Dhamma, the, the truth, and the teachings of the Buddha that point to that truth, that show us where to look and how to look in order to establish ourselves in that refuge of perfect presence. And the Sangha, the uh, community, our own um, capacity for, for liberation, our own aspiration and our sincere um, efforts that we make on our path uh, to, to realize the truth that the Buddha pointed to. So he requested the three refuges and also the five precepts, uh, refraining from killing or harming other creatures, refraining from stealing, from sexual misconduct, from wrong speech and the use of intoxicants. So this is something that we can all undertake together. What I'll do is I'll chant Namo Tassa three times, the basic homage to, to the Buddha, the perfectly enlightened being who lived and taught 2,500 years ago, a long time ago. So we, we honor him and then the, the going for refuge. So I'll recite it three times and you repeat three times and then we go line by line. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. 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 Buddhang saranangga chami. Buddhang saranangga chami. Dhammang saranangga chami. Dhammang saranangga chami. Sanghang saranangga chami. Sangham saranangga chami. Dutiampi budhang saranangga chami. Dutiampi budham saranangga chami. Dutiampi dhammang saranangga chami. Dutiampi dhammang saranangga chami. Dutiampi sankhang saranangga chami. Dutiampi sankham saranangga chami. Tatiampi budhang saranangga chami. <coughs> 
Tatiyam pi budham saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi dhammam saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi dhammam saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi sankham saranam gachami. Tatiyam pi sankham saranam gachami. Ti saranat gamanani ti tang. Amabante ae. Panati pata where money sika padang samadi ami. Panati pata where money sika padang samadi ami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adina dhana where money seek up a dung samadhi hami. Adina dhana where money seek up a dung samadhi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara where money seek up a dung samadhi hami. Kame sumi chachara where money seek up a dung samadhi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musawada where of money seek up a dung samadhi hami. Musawada where of money seek up a dung samadhi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. I undertake the precept to refrain from lying. Sura Miraya Majapamada Tana, where of money seek up a dung samadhi hami. Sura Miraya Majapamada Tana, where of money seek up a dung samadhi hami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha sika padani si lena sukha tingyanti si lena boga sampada si lena nebu tingyanti tasama si lang wisotaye Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So these precepts lead to happiness. They lead to true wealth, the wealth of the heart, and they lead to perfect liberation. Therefore, let us work hard to perfect uh, ourselves in uh, living in a wise and skillful way for our own benefit and for the benefit of all beings. So, having established our uh, selves in, in the sila, we taking the precepts, having taken time to reflect on the and to to pay to pay homage to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Now is the opportunity for us to practice meditation together. So I expect many of you have had a very busy day and probably experienced many interactions or uh, seen many different things, done many different things. And so now is a time for us to, to stop doing things and a chance just to be uh, sitting quietly together and allowing the mind to settle. Uh, 
sometimes it takes a little time for the mind to settle, a little time of not doing, not seeing or hearing or just being still, being quiet. It can take a little time for the mind to calm down. And so it's important that we bring a lot of patience to our practice. So I'll offer a little bit of guidance as we go along, just as an encouragement. And what I'd like us to do, first of all, is take a little while to, little time to find a good posture. I'm going to sit cross-legged and I invite you to do the same if you can. And if you can't, then kneeling is fine. And if you prefer to sit on a chair, that's completely fine. The main thing is to try and find a position where you're nicely upright and also alert. So the, the idea is that the, the posture, how we sit, um, reflects um, an inner attitude of being alert, awake, attentive, nicely balanced. So, um, So having established our physical posture, take a little time to feel our way into that, just so that we're actually fully, fully present sitting here. It's not just that we um, establish the posture and go back up into our heads again, <laughs> which is we can do, but what I would encourage is more uh, to take advantage of this time to just feel, feel yourself into, into the body, you know, just be with the body. And the Buddha spoke about the body as being the first foundation, the first reference place, the first way that we can establish mindfulness is to, to come into the body, to reflect on the body. So we can take a moment to do that. We can notice different sensations, the sensations of pressure where we're sitting, perhaps also the sensation of the clothes on the skin, uh, the air on the skin, if it's a little bit chilly or a little bit warm, uh, you may notice that. And if the outside temperature is the same as the body temperature, then we probably won't experience any particular sensation of the air on the skin, just be quite comfortable. So we can just take a little time to notice, notice these things. The feeling of the body form, the, the mass of the body and the space around it. Chances are it's quite a familiar space. We can also notice if there are any sounds happening around us. And those of you in London may have the sound of traffic going by or the sound of your neighbor's TV or telephone ringing somewhere or a child crying or laughing or conversations in the next room. So these are all part of our present moment experience. They can be distracting if we allow ourselves to be irritated by them or to feel that they shouldn't be there. And they can also just be part of the, the current landscape, what we're experiencing. We establish a sense of easeful presence. Now taking our awareness around the body, relaxing throughout the body, just setting it at ease, releasing tension from the head and the face. From around the shoulders, let the shoulders drop a little bit. 
the arms. Releasing any sense of constriction or tightness from around the heart center. So there's a sense of peacefulness, a sense of softening and opening in the heart. Moving down to the solar plexus, the middle part of the body, noticing whether that's activated in some way, if there's a feeling of excitement or slight anxiety or fear, or irritation, or anticipation of some sort. And just notice if there's a bit of a fluttery feeling or a tight feeling there and just see if you can Allow that to settle. Now coming down into the belly, the lower abdomen. I like to take time here to imagine that you can draw the air right in down into the belly. It's a very Lovely, long, slow inhalation. And then when the whole torso has become distended, just very slowly and easily let the air out again. So energizing as we breathe in, relaxing, releasing with the out breath. Taking time to relax the legs, releasing any tension, particularly from around the knees, hips. There's a sense of ease in the legs. And if they do become uncomfortable or restless at any point, you're welcome to just gently change posture or even to stand up for a moment or two. This can be helpful if there's a lot of bodily restlessness. Or if you're feeling very sleepy, just standing up is a wonderful way of bringing energy into the system. So the body is nicely upright, supported by the spine, also held with a sense of ease, a sense of lightness. The head perched on the top, nicely balanced. If the eyes are open, they're looking straight ahead. And of course, if you prefer to close the eyes, that's completely fine. The usual focus for our awareness is the breath, the normal breathing of the body, linked, if you wish, with a, a mantra, a word or a phrase that you can use as a, as a reminder, as a support for awareness. The Buddhist mantra, Bud, as you breathe in, Do as you breathe out, or some secular word or phrase that you find helpful. Repeat it with each breath or just from time to time. And when you find the mind wandering, just come back to the word or the phrase, come back to the breath. So that you enjoy the sensation of the body breathing. And little by little, the mind comes to rest with the breath, 
comfortably at ease, fully present here, now. One breath, and then the next breath. Was it your thoughts, the memories of the day? You can just leave them to one side. Try not to involve yourself with them. Just leave them be, let them go. Make the main focus this natural process of the body breathing. Aware of the in-breath from beginning to end. Aware of the outbreath from beginning to end, enjoying the sensation of the body breathing. you find yourself involved with the thinking, simply come back to the next breath. Try not to contend with the thoughts, not to struggle with them, but just turn aside. Turn to the breath, attend to the breath. This sensation that we can experience in the body as it's happening here, now.
try to notice if the mind slips into a lot of activity, We're thinking, planning, remembering, worrying. These things can kind of creep into the mind without us noticing. So if you notice any of this arising, then please just set it to one side, come back to the breath. Allow the mind to be very, very simple. Quietly here, now. And if the mind is very, very restless, then try taking two or three very, very deep breaths, filling up the whole body slowly, easily, and then slowly, easily, letting the air out. When you've fully breathed out, pause for a moment and then breathe in again. Do that two or three times. That'll help the mind to settle.
can be helpful as the meditation comes towards the end to use the opportunity to bring up thoughts of kindness, kindness towards yourself particularly, using a word or a phrase, may this being be well, may I be well. Or something that you find meaningful. May the heart be at ease. Ahang Sukito Homi, the Pali words. So that we rest with a sense of ease, a sense of well-being. And gently allow that radiance to extend, extend to those around us to our dear ones, wherever they may be. To beings that we may know or know of who are sick, struggling either physically or mentally, emotionally. May they be well. We find inner steadiness, balance, healing. Those who are bereaved, who've lost dear ones, parents, partners, children. May they find peace. Extending this heart to those living in situations of conflict, domestic violence, or war, political oppression. May they also find inner ease, balance, steadiness, courage. Just allowing this heart to extend, to touch all beings everywhere. Over the entire planet, the animals, plants, oceans, rivers, mountains, the earth itself. The air. Extending out into the universe. All beings everywhere find balance, well-being, freedom from every kind of suffering. Coming back to this being, sitting here, breathing, 
May this being be well, inwardly at ease, balanced, steady. So if you'd like to get comfortable, I can offer a short Dhamma reflection and then we can have time for a few questions. I was reflecting on this practice that we're all engaged in and uh, how, whether we want to or not, um, as we, as the time goes by, uh, the weeks, the months, the years, the decades, uh, we may find certain changes happening in our lives. Uh, And I was reflecting on this particularly, uh, this particular time coming up to the Christmas, the festive season as it's it's called when people seem to do a lot of eating and drinking and uh, entertaining themselves in different ways, gathering together, families, friends. Uh, doing things, a time that can be um, a lot of indulgence and also a lot of a lot of loneliness. A lot of, and now this, with the um, the whole kind of concern about the pandemic and how that's developing, um, a lot of fear. And as we know, fear often breeds um, antagonism. You know, people can be very um, um, aggressive towards each other. You know, if they're frightened, this can bring out something very unpleasant. And so uh, for us as as Buddhist practitioners, who perhaps don't have quite the same feeling about Christmas, um, it can be quite a, uh, a challenging time, a difficult time. Uh, because you know, either uh, you know, be a feeling of um, <clears throat> people expecting us to to join in and participate in different things, and, and perhaps we just really prefer to be rather quiet. Um, and I've spent quite a lot of Christmases as a nun uh, with my family. Uh, they they're always very glad if I can come and spend Christmas with them. And uh, one of the things I I noticed that is is really important to try and do is to at least have a certain amount of time each day when I can just sit quietly and be on my own, be quiet. Um, And finding a way to participate to some degree, to the degree that my uh, my rule allows, but without you know, compromising my own integrity, my own feeling of what's what's appropriate, what's suitable. And uh, people quite often ask questions about this, how, how to respond when over the years, they're, they're less inclined to do some of the things that maybe they used to do, more inclined to be still and quiet and maybe alone more and um, maybe to be with nature. And uh, 
it can be uh, there can be a kind of longing there. You, know, you just you, you a feeling of it would be lovely if we could uh, join in and enjoy things in the same way that other people are, are doing. Uh, sort of feeling a little bit uh, estranged, perhaps. Uh, particularly if people are, are drinking a lot around us, that can be very, you know, can be quite difficult. So for me, what I try to do is just to keep my heart open and friendly, even if I'm not being, behaving in the same way um, as the other people around me, at least to uh, recognize when the heart starts getting caught up in judgment or criticism of what's happening, of what other people are doing, you know, blaming, judging, um, into a state of negativity, resentment, or you know, a sense of slight superiority. <laughs> I'm, I'm better than you. This kind of, um, you know, I'm, I'm a practicing Buddhist, I have my meditation. You know, we can, we can, um, our meditation can, can make us feel quite a little bit proud, a little bit aloof. Um, so it can be, it can be an interesting challenge to find an appropriate balance, you know, so that we do maintain, um, uh, our own, <clears throat> inner, quiet and calm. Um, and we keep the heart open with a heart of, of goodwill, a heart of kindness, and to find ways of, of participating in ways that are not <clears throat> going against our own precepts, our own, you know, what we're comfortable with. Um, and yet at the same time, not, not being standoffish, not being um, unfriendly or um, rude even to people. Uh, <clears throat> I used to think of renunciation as being something very uh, unpleasant. You, the, the renunciation seemed to be about giving up things that you enjoyed, that you liked. Uh, but I think one of the things that we discover is, as time goes by that Renunciation is actually, it's a kind of letting go, a leaving aside of things that maybe are no longer uh, so interesting to us, no longer such fun, uh, no longer things that we particularly enjoy doing. Maybe we even find them rather foolish uh, and not something that we're particularly interested in doing anymore. Uh, So I, one, of the, one of the things I've noticed is it's, it's, it's like a falling away of, of things, a natural inclining towards uh, simplicity. Uh, it's keeping our lives simple. You know, being careful about um, how we spend our time. Uh, and even when we have a choice, you know, who we associate with. In the very first verse of the Mahamangala Sutta talks about, you know, associating with, with wise people, avoiding those who are foolish. Yeah. So I, I, love to, I love to hang out with, with monastics. <laughs> with monks and nuns, you know, even of different traditions. I just love to be with people who've, you know, made a very um, sincere and complete commitment to um, a path of awakening. Uh, and I love to hang out with people who, who love to practice, who are interested in practice and practice of Dhamma. Uh, understanding their own lives, understanding 
and suffering, the way that they make lives that they make their lives difficult. Through uh, allowing the mind to get caught up in things that really aren't important, or even things that are important but which we can't do anything about. You know, at this time, there seem to be many very serious um, concerns, very serious issues um, that we hear about through the media. Mm. You know, awful uh, crisis of you know, homeless people, refugee people, you know, who've had to leave behind everything, their homes, their families, their possessions their position, their status, their place in society, their jobs. They've had to leave everything to flee from some oppressive regime or some very, very difficult circumstances. You know, what must that be like? Uh, how can we respond to that? How can we respond to the whole climate crisis? Uh, there are attempts happening, you know, initiatives, and there are certainly some things that we can do, but it, it's, it can seem completely overwhelming. The pandemic, plenty of things to feel concerned and overwhelmed about. And uh, as Buddhist practitioners, we make our priority uh, taking care of the heart. You know, may I abide in well-being. And we don't say may I abide in well-being because we don't care about anybody else. It's not because we don't care about the climate. It's not because we don't care about the pandemic, about the refugee crisis, about all the other crises and difficulties in the world. But it's precisely because we do care. <clears throat> <clears throat> And we realize that the only way that we can contribute effectively is by taking care of our own heart, accessing um, as best we can our um, uh, attuning to Dhamma, because it's only from there that real wisdom and compassion can arise, that clarity can arise, that we can really discern what we as individuals, how we as individuals can most effectively contribute. It might seem irresponsible, or it might seem a funny way to go about things. And I'm sure there'll be many people who would criticize this approach, but I've found for myself, it's the only approach that makes sense. Um, you know, I've, I've tried, I've tried worrying about things. I've tried getting upset and angry about things. I've tried thinking about things, um, talking about things. But I always find with those approaches, you know, if it's coming from like a reaction from my head, you know, that's, that's where all the thinking and the worrying happens. It doesn't seem to go very far. It doesn't seem to bring a very good result. And it certainly doesn't make me feel good. There may be a kind of, uh, you know, well, I'm doing my bit. But if we think in that way, and if we really think in that way, we always feel our bit's not good enough. There's always more to do. Whereas the approach of the heart seems to bring us to a kind of um, a place of ease, a place of balance, a place of fullness, um, from which we can contribute in um, direct active ways, you know, doing and saying things. And my sense is that there's also um, an immense um, contribution that is made just through the presence of somebody who is inwardly balanced, who's living with integrity, who's living in Dhamma, who's actually 
uh, understood the meaning of refuge and is making that refuge work in their own lives. It was actually trying to live according to the, the Buddhist guidelines and precepts, you know, really making an effort to live with integrity and sincerity and to avoid causing uh, any extra harm uh, to themselves and to others. And of course we all make mistakes, and of course we mess up and uh, you know, cause harm or difficulties to ourselves and to each other. Of course we do. Uh, we're not perfect yet. But um, we can perhaps also learn how to avoid getting caught in uh, blaming ourselves, judging ourselves, punishing ourselves. I mean, all of these things that we've learned to do to ourselves over our lives, you know, through the ways that we've been brought up, we learn how to judge ourselves, to blame ourselves, to feel bad about ourselves. But as Buddhist practitioners, we realize actually that's not what the Buddha was teaching. That's not what the Buddha was encouraging. Uh, supporting well-being, taking care of ourselves. So a wise concern, a wise consideration. In, in uh, the Pali, is these words, hiri and otapa. These are the guardians of the world. Uh, one of them is, is like shame or regret. You know, if we do something wrong, then we do feel some, some regret. And we, we try to, to learn from our mistake. You know, so we don't repeat it. You know, we, we take care. We try to learn. If we do something good, then we, we learn from that. We do that again. We repeat that. Um, we have a natural sense of concern to, to, to avoid doing things that are going to be harmful. So these, these are ways that we, we protect ourselves and protect each other. A very appropriate response if we do something foolish, if we make a mistake. It's like, Ouch, oh dear, I wish I hadn't done that. But we don't say, oh, I'm a terrible person, I shouldn't do that, I'm a hopeless case, I'll never be any good. You know, I'm the worst, I'm the worst, the most hopeless case. We don't, we don't do that. <laughs> I mean, other than if we want to make a joke about it. But much better just to say, okay, Chandasiri, that wasn't very good. So what was happening when you made that mistake? What was happening when you said that? Why did you say that? Were you afraid? Were you feeling jealous? Were you confused? Were you frightened? You know, often just a little bit of um, wise reflection is wonderful. Pali word, Yoni So Manasi Karas is taking care to, to go back to the source, to, to to investigate, to understand what was happening. Because then, you know, if we, if we realize, okay, well, I was jealous, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't like the fact that that person had done something better than me or had something that I wanted. So I was mean, I said something mean. Okay, well, that happened. Let's see if we can avoid doing that same thing again. Instead of feeling jealous, can we celebrate our own goodness? the blessings of our lives, can we do that? Don't have to be jealous. Don't have to be afraid. When we go for refuge to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, when we're fully present, we don't have to be afraid because we have everything that we need to respond to whatever life brings us. Perfect mindfulness. That's our resource. That's our weapon, if you like, and the weapons of Dhamma. So we can meet any adversity, any difficulty, when we're fully present, fully aware, and fully committed to living a life that is not going to cause harm to ourselves or to anybody else. So I invite you over this festive time to contemplate these things and to uh, look at ways of celebrating the um, possibility that each one of us has to, to liberate the heart from greed, hatred, and delusion.
that we had the chance to experience a life of, of, of lightness and joy. Maybe just momentarily, you know, we may just have a moment of letting go, a moment of actually uh, seeing how uh, we can feel a sense of gladness and a lack of regret when we avoid doing something harmful, saying that thing that's maybe very, very clever, but so painful to receive. Um, so, yes, life is a, a constant challenge, isn't it? And as I said, we constantly make mistakes, but we constantly can learn, constant learning. And that's a very wonderful thing. So I'm noticing that the time is slipping by and I'd like to um, offer these words for your contemplation, uh, consideration. Uh, set aside anything that doesn't make sense, think is rubbish, and uh, turn over the things that do make sense and see how you can apply them in your own lives. Uh, so that step by step, each one of us can experience greater degrees of freedom and happiness. And we have a bit of time for if there is anything that Anybody would like to say, um, either in response to what I've said, or if you have a question about your practice, um, meditation, or just daily life practice, and uh, I can have a go at answering, or offering some kind of a response. Um, you can write a chat message, or you can raise your hand and Maybe wonder you can, um, or you can invite people to unmute. I wonder if that's the way to do it. I can't remember how we usually manage this. Um, Is there anything anybody would like to ask? I can't hear you, Nick. I see James has put his hand up. He may be putting it into the chat box. I don't know. But it may be simpler if, he, if you unmute James and just ask your question. Then we'll thank you. Thank you. I was wondering how you think one might appropriately respond to what, when you believe you see others behaving in ways that are destructive. And I was thinking of particular, the, in particular of the part that Buddhist monks played in the persecution of the Rohingya in Burma, in Myanmar. Um. <clears throat> Well, I find that in those kind of situations, what I, I always try to do is to come into the heart um, because there can be a tremendous compulsion uh, to uh, react or to respond to things that seem so unfair, so inappropriate. And... Um, it's not that I would ever condone any kind of violence or any kind of oppression of people. Um, but sometimes our speech or action, if it's just a reaction, can end up mm -hmm. making things worse, can end up bringing about greater confusion, greater violence, and perpetuate just a chain of um, unfortunate incidents so I'm very interested in people really cultivating their practice and really trusting that they have the capacity to um, 
discern the most skillful way forward, which may not be the obvious response. Um, it can be useful to reflect on your gifts, things that you're good at, things that you enjoy doing, uh, to, to, to develop those. You know, for example, some people love to write and they can use, use words as a way of um, pointing things out. Um, there are people who are very good at artists, or cartoonists, and some of the cartoonists are the best uh, political commentators um, of all. It can really point in a very precise way to things that are harmful or uh, inappropriate uh, in society. I was thinking the other day about the um, uh, kind of clowns and court gestures, co uh, court jesters, comics, who also are very have a very um, unique gift for pointing out things. So I'm not saying that this is something that you should be doing, but to actually reflect on your own your own skills, your own gifts. So whether it's writing a letter to somebody, whether it's um, approaching somebody directly, um, whether it's just um, conducting maybe a vigil of some kind, you know, getting together with a few friends and just maybe lighting a candle with the intention of sending um, metta, you know, thoughts of goodwill, of, of benevolence to the people who are being oppressed and also to the oppressors because often they're the people who most need um, help and support and guidance so they can really understand uh, the harm that they're doing. Um, Nobody gets away with anything, as we all know, according to Buddhist principles. You know, if you act or speak in cruel and harmful ways, it's going to come back for you, back to you, whether in this lifetime or whether in some future lifetime. So, uh, I, this is probably not not the answer that you were expecting or hoping, but this is the way that I reflect on these kinds of situations. And I hope that might be a bit helpful um, as a way of um, uh, approaching the kind of difficulties that you're talking about. If it's more with people that you know, like mm. family or good friends who are behaving in foolish ways, then um, I'm thinking particularly say around about this, this kind of, what they call the festive season when people tend to take a lot of alcohol, then it can be um, wise to consider what kind of state the people are in. You know, sometimes if you if you go into a situation, you actually you know you put yourself at risk. You know, mm. <laughs> you can you can. Um, so sometimes it's best just to stay quiet on the side. Um, sometimes there's nothing you can you can really do actively but just your your calm presence can support a kind of rather than escalating the conflict can support a kind of a, a settling of things um, I was struck many years ago I went to a, a conference for hospital chaplains and there was this one uh, chaplain who uh, was talking about experiences that he had when he went into uh, situations where there was a, a you know, like a, a medical crisis. And he would just kind of stand there and there'd be people kind of milling around with all kinds of machinery and doing things and trying to stop the person from dying. And uh, so all the, when the crisis had passed, then they would say to him, "Oh, now, Father, you can go and you know you can you know go and say your prayers." And he said, "Well, that, actually, that, that I, that's what I've been doing all along." <laughs> so just his presence was his offering mm -hmm. to the situation. Uh, so it's not always that we have to do something or say something, but just our being uh, can support a resolution of some kind of conflict or difficulty. And sometimes that takes more courage than um, getting in there or, you know, um, 
uh, protesting in a more direct and obvious way. So I hope that's a little bit helpful. Yes, thank you. Is there anything else anybody would like to ask? Nick, I have uh, sent you two questions uh -huh. through you, Nick. Nick. Thank you. I'll read them. Okay. <clears throat> so the first question is, <clears throat> my father passed away last year, and today is his birthday. From a Buddhist point of view, what is the best way to honor him daily? Thank you. Uh, well, in a short sentence, we would say share merit, but um, just to, to put a little bit more, to fill that out a bit, I like to think of, of like, um, yeah, dedicating my practice for their welfare, dedicating my life for their welfare. So on, on your father's birthday, well, the very fact that you're participating in an evening like this is a very suitable way of honoring him. You know, doing a puja, paying homage to the triple gem, uh, taking the precepts, uh, you know, determining to live in a, in a conscious and skillful, um, responsible way. Um, as a way of that, that, that's a very wonderful way of, of honoring your father. Um, <clears throat> the traditional way that it's done in, in say traditional Buddhist countries is that they often would, uh, people would gather to come to the monastery and, and make offerings, you know, so offer a meal or part of a meal uh, to the Sangha. That's a kind of traditional Buddhist offering. Um, uh, it's certainly something that you can do, and I would encourage if, 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 if you feel that you would like to do that, that's certainly a very good thing to do. Or you may want to just donate something to, to a charity, <clears throat> something that your father was interested in. Uh, that can be another, another gesture. Or just, you know, making kind gestures, do, do, doing something to help somebody else. These are all, all uh, beautiful ways of, um, honoring the memory of, of, of our dear ones. Um, and you can take time to reflect on his life, you know, what he meant to you, what he, you know, the particular qualities that were um, significant for you as you were growing up. If there were things that were difficult about your relationship, then it can be a good time to um, offer forgiveness. You just set those, set any any um, anger or resentment or bitterness, just to set that to one side, um, and to do that quite consciously. You know, because every every most relationships are kind of fraught with difficulties of one kind or another, as well as the the positive and the beautiful things. So using it as an opportunity to really um, make peace and to celebrate um, his life and what he meant for you. And uh, the gift of life that he's given you. And to, to really make the very best use of this opportunity that you have. Uh, these will be um, appropriate ways of, of honoring him and celebrating him. Uh, from a Buddhist point of view. So I hope that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sister. There, there is another question. Yes. Which reads as follows. I would like to ask you if you could please speak about acceptance, about things we cannot change yet. Thank you. Hmm.
Well, um, one of the most important qualities that seems to come into every uh, religious teachings is uh, patience. And not the kind of impatient patience where we say, well, I've been practicing patience with this for so long and it still hasn't changed. That's actually not patience. That's a kind of bargaining. <laughs> but um, the patience that is willing to bear with a situation for as long as it takes. So there are so many different examples of this. I mean, I'm sure everybody in their own lives has different examples, both in terms of, um, you know, you can have it on, look at the, like the political situation, social situation, uh, relationships, one's own practice, one's own life. Um, there's many, many opportunities for developing, cultivating patience. Patience can seem like a very passive um, or even a kind of repressive practice. You know, you trying not to mind something, trying to, um, or pretending you don't mind, that you're willing to wait. But actually, in my experience, patience actually demands a very active kind of engagement um, with the particular situation that you're, you're dealing with. So to be able to acknowledge that you would like things to be otherwise. You know, okay, I don't like the way this is. I don't like this situation. I would like it to be different. But this is how it is right now. This is what's happening right now. Can I be with it? Can I patiently bear with things as they are without tumbling into negativity or resentment or bitterness or anger you know, without getting caught up in any of these negative um, emotions. Can I just patiently be with it, alert and attentive? Because sometimes there are things that we can do to help things along, you know, just waiting for the right moment to say the right thing, you know, the thing that's going to allow, enable a change. Sometimes we, we can do that. So it's a kind of alert attentiveness, as well as a just an inner balance, um, a sense of yeah, acceptance and calm. So taking care of the heart, taking care of the mind, not allowing it to tumble into negativity, acknowledging that we would like things to be different and just acknowledging this is how it is. Right now it's like this. In time it'll change. I mean, everything changes. Um, it can't stay the same forever, but sometimes it seems to take a very long time before it changes. And I like to reflect, I mean, I don't like to reflect, sorry, <laughs> but it's important to remember times when you have tried to force something to change. Um, I mean, I don't know what the situation is that you're, you're referring to in your own life, but sometimes in my life, there's been something I haven't liked and I've tried to force it to change. I've pushed a little bit too hard or I've said something that was maybe not at all helpful, you know, a kind of reaction and with a sense of anger, a sense of ill will. And whenever I do that, there's always some kind of a comeback and there's always a sense of regret. So having done that a few times, I'm, pretty determined to avoid doing that again, even if I don't like a situation, I'm willing to wait until it changes or until a situation arises where I can support a change in a good direction, in a good way. You're coming from this place of inner balance. Of, I mean, Ajahn Chah would talk about letting go. You know, so we might have a, a longing for something to change, but we let go of that longing because um, we're more interested in supporting Dhamma, in supporting the truth of the situation, in maintaining that sense of inner balance and attunement to what is true, what is wise, what is good, rather than just reacting because of our own uh, ideas about things. 
So it can sometimes be rather a long wait, but it can be a very interesting wait if we can be mindful, if we can be present with the situation as it is. It can be very, very fascinating, very interesting. So please hang on. Change will happen. <laughs> Maybe not as fast as you would like, but it will certainly happen. So we're just about at the end of the time. So unless there's a really pressing question, perhaps um, we can finish with a little chant and then the uh, closing homage. So I suggest we do um, the May I Abide in Wellbeing, um, which I think is maybe page 32 or 33, 33 I think it might be, uh, in the chanting book. And if you can't find it or if it doesn't come up on the screen, we can, you can just listen or if you know it, you can chant along with me. Page 41, actually. Oh, page 41. Yeah. Thank you. Well done. Excellent. Okay. So we can just chant this in a kind of gentle, reflective kind of way. Um, <clears throat> now let us chant the reflection on universal well-being. May I abide in well-being, in freedom from affliction, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety, and may I maintain well-being in myself. May everyone abide in well-being, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety. And may they maintain well-being in themselves. May all beings be released from all suffering. And may they not be parted from the good fortune they have attained. When they act upon intention, all beings are the owners of their action and inherit its results. Their future is born from such action, companion to such action and its results will be their home. All actions with intention, be they skillful or harmful, of such acts they will be the end.
Thank you very much. And um, I believe that next week is going to be the final class of the term. And then next term, I believe, is going to be begin the first class, I think, is going to be on the 10th of January. But Nick can correct me about that. <laughs> um, you're quite correct with the dates. And uh, so I, I wish you a, a peaceful and wonderful festive season and a very um, auspicious new year. <laughs> May I just thank you on behalf of the whole group for all the teachings you've offered this uh, last term. I know that the next term after winter uh, is a winter retreat, so we won't be seeing you for a few months. So I'd like to wish you a fulfilling and rewarding retreat in the winter and look forward to seeing you again in the spring. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Hmm.